Here's an introduction to the divergence theorem in two dimensions. This is something that um, the Stewart book talks about a little bit, but I really feel like they give short shrift to, and it's, I think it's great, great, great to understand this in two dimensions before you understand it in three dimensions. Um, so what we've got here is a new kind of vector integral over a curve. Uh, we've got the, the usual kind of line integral of a vector over a curve, and that calculates work. It calculates things like a flow or circulation uh, along a curve. But what if we have a situation where, um, here's, here's a good thing to think about. Think about a table um, with water sloshing around in it or some sort of fluid. A gas is actually a good thing to think about because gases can kind of get more and less dense, easier than water can. Um, or one thing I, I like to think about is like an air table, you know, like an air hockey table or like an air table for like a physics lab um, with tiny, 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 tiny little pinpricks all over. And you want to really think about like there's actually a, a tiny, tiny pinprick almost everywhere at the table. And there's a fluid sloshing around here. So it can move and slosh and maybe get more or less dense and collect in various places. And it can also come out of these holes and disappear into the holes. And what happens if you take like um, a table tennis net and put it down in here. And so the side view would be like, uh, here's the table. And here's what I mean by uh, the net is like, you know, here's the the net. It can, it's, so fluid can flow through that, can flow across that in whatever direction. And we want to know, suppose the fluid is flowing like this, maybe. Suppose this is the, the flow of the fluid, this vector field. I'd like to know, in total, how much is flowing across this net. And so that's called the flux, just a Latin word for flow, the flux of a vector field F through, or you even say across is a good word, a curve C in the plane. And so how would we do that? It's very similar to the calculation for a vector field, the, the flux of, or the, the integral of a vector field along a curve. The flux is going to be integrate, sum up along all points of the curve. And what am I going to do? At, if I'm at this point in the curve, I'm going to take the vector field there, and instead of uh, comparing it to the vector, the tangent vector that goes along the curve, I want to compare that to the vector that's perpendicular to the curve. And I'm going to call that n hat for the unit normal to the curve. And I claim that if you take f and you dot it with n, that's going to give you a scalar function at every point on the curve, and then just take a scalar um, integral of that, that that's going to give an idea of how much is the, the, the vector field is flowing across the curve. So let's see. If f and n happen to be perpendicular, like um, probably right around in here, yeah, here f is going along the curve, which would give a great contribution to a circulation, but that's not what we're doing now. Um, here, the vector field and the normal are perpendicular. It's not flowing across the curve at all. It's flowing along that. It's not going through the net. The way I like to say it is if you're trying to catch fish, this is not a good place to catch the fish because they're swimming along next to the net. Here, they are going fairly aggressively through the net. And here, they're going almost exactly perpendicular, and that's going to give a bigger contribution. So we're saying, what's the, another way to say it is, what's the component of F, the blue vector field, that is actually going across the curve in the direction that's perpendicular to the curve at any point? Get those numbers, add them up along the curve. OK, well, let's see if there's a better way to do that. I've talked about how scalar line integrals are actually harder to calculate than vector line integrals. But in, in disguise, this is really going to turn out to be just as nice as our standard vector line integral. So let's remember what, um, what the ds is. And then I'm going to put in the n as well. ds is um, the magnitude 
of the velocity vector dt. Okay. And let's think about what the unit normal is going to be. Well, there's this is going to get more interesting for surfaces in three-dimensional space. We've talked about it a little bit actually a while ago when we talked a little bit about parametrized curves or surfaces. But here it's actually pretty simple. There's a nice trick in two dimensions. If you've already got your velocity vector r prime, all we need to do is rotate it 90 degrees. And so we're going to take r prime of t, which is um, you know, dx dt, dy dt, I guess we're using round brackets, and then we're going to rotate it 90 degrees, and we know a trick for that. And so we switch the two, and we put a minus sign on one of them. Now this is a tricky issue, it's the orientation issue again. I like to know which direction I want to do. I wrote this as an outward unit normal for this closed curve. I could have chosen the inward unit normal. But our convention is going to be, if it's a, a closed curve like this, I want outward flux. It's going to be very similar to convention about counterclockwise. Okay, So let's see what happens. In this picture, I want this to happen. Okay, I want to go from a, clock, a counterclockwise, a positive orientation for the velocity. I want that to turn into outward for the unit normal. Just ba basically a matter of convention, not a big deal. And so, for example, here, dx dt and dy is here both positive, and I want the the x component to end up being positive still, but the y component to be negative. So that's where the minus sign is going to go. Okay. And um, okay, so that's going to be a, a vector that's normal to the curve, but it's not unit length. But what was the the magnitude of this guy? The magnitude of our prime was just the speed. Magnitude of our prime. If I want to make it into a unit, and I haven't changed the magnitude because I just switched the order of the th these things and put a minus sign on. This magnitude is still uh, the same thing, the speed of the curve. And so I'm going to get this guy, dy dt comma minus dx dt, divided by magnitude of the velocity. Hey, look, they cancel. That's nice. And so what I get is, um, let's put this in terms of p and q. And we'll see that it's very nice. Pi dot qj plus qj dotted with dy dt i minus dx dt j dt. And so um, I'm going to put it into the differential form notation because that is, even though it, it sometimes obscures the um, the geometry a little bit it is the most efficient notation. So it turns out to be integral p dy minus q dx. Okay? Or I tend to want to write the, the dx's first, so I'm gonna, even though it puts a minus sign in front. Um, I guess I don't need, the, uh, need that. Okay, or minus q dx plus p dy. Okay? So it turns out that that integral is a way to measure the flux of a vector field across a curve. And it's really, really similar to the integral of the vector field along the curve. It's just switching and put a minus sign, because that's all we actually really did, was that switch and put a minus sign into this whole process. Okay. Another way to write it is um, the flux is the integral over the curve of Take the vector field. So notice what's what, this is the same thing you would get is if instead of rotating, we could have been really tricky, and instead of rotating the velocity vector to become the normal vector, we could take all the blue arrows and rotate them 90 degrees the other way, and we would get exactly the same answer. And so you can say it's the same thing as, let's denote that temporarily as the rotated version of f. Uh, dot dr. And so what you do is you take your vector field and take this blue curve and just rotate it. Instead of rotating the red curve 90 degrees clockwise, rotate blue 90 degrees counterclockwise and just take the ordinary line integral of that guy. And that's going to be exactly the same thing because it's going to, again, switch the p and q and put a minus sign in. That's going to be an easy way to compare this and use Green's theorem to prove things about the flux.